All right, all right, all right, all right. Greetings and welcome back. Doesn't it feel like it's been a really long time? <laughs> welcome back. This is Amuna Yisrael, Solanamis 101, Lev Project. Um, yeah, we're about to go in. So uh, I was. Um, I hope everybody's doing well. Let me just start off by saying that. I want to thank everybody who has supported the Lev Project, whether by listening, whether by sharing, or whether by investing in your own education. And that is a beautiful thing. So I want to thank everybody who's listening to this live or who may be listening on replay. And if you find some value, definitely pass it along. If you've been, you know, for the last, what, 10 weeks, we went through the underground series collectively as part of the Lev Project. We spoke about, and it was great. I loved it. Uh, I loved it. No, hold on wait, one second. It's on this live stream. One second. Uh, so we spoke about it collectively. We had those because I know, you know, it's an emotionally charged uh, and we have to be with others who are kind of experiencing it with us to go through the process. And so that was that was also cool as well. And I got a lot of feedback on that because, again, I just speak a little bit about the left project while we're waiting. We're not, you know, there's plenty of people who are just we're commenting from a level of ignorance or from a level of entertainment. And I didn't even know about underground. I, it was just in my spirit to do this from the beginning of the year. And so when it came, I said, oh, boom, perfect opportunity. But we have a lot of our people who are still out there, not really looking for edification or learning or they're really just looking to comment. Like it's another, like it's scandal or like it's, you know, uh, whatever, NYP, this blue, CSI, like it's some form of entertainment. And I got uh, quite a number of feedback that that's what many people, as we are experiencing this together, because it was live, I guess live is, you know, the, everybody's watching it at the same time, let me say. And you're looking to see what someone else felt. And a lot of the times what they saw out there was from a very topical entertainment tonight type of way or conversation. And um, they were grateful that we could have the conversation that we have here at the Left Project, which is to, to invoke thought, um, to elevate our minds through education. So I, when I was between, actually there's so many narratives to read, I wasn't sure which one I was gonna read. At first I was like, maybe we should go for a shorter one because it took us a real long time because of the fact that Underground came on to get through 30 years and change. Um, but it was a good one, it was really good one. Uh, so I said, huh? And then I said I was going to get European because I'm not sure if we did John Barbo. I got to go back and check. But anyway, long story short, I wanted to show us how the things that we're seeing, if we're not educated, we don't understand what we're seeing. And so I don't know if you remember the scene earlier on in Underground where they, he asked them, the two abolitionists, if they wanted to join. And they finally decided that they wanted to join and they got to his office and a man had shipped himself to freedom in a box and he was in there with his wife but the wife died and he came out do you remember i don't know if you guys remember that scene let me make sure that i'm over here on youtube so i can see what you guys are seeing but anyway long story short that's an actual story that's something that actually happened and so that's the story we're going to read today because understand for them to do their study for them to do this study and to have this conversation, they would have been going through these narratives and reading what we read on and what we're reading and then concoct their story. So this is the story of Henry Box Brown. And I thought just coming right off of the, the Underground Railroad, which everybody would understand that that's the latter part of slavery. Like that's not the heat or like they would say the thick of things. That's when things are, are now abolitionists are fighting and, and this is now coming to the end of quote unquote chattel slavery. So that's always good to keep in mind the time frame of what we're watching. So everybody's asking me. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here once again. Here we always have it. If you desire to read, just let me know. And we could arrange that to make it happen. Oh, wait a minute. Did I put the link in the box? Let me see if I put the link in the box for everybody so that you can. I think I did. The link should be in the box for Yes, it is for Henry Box Brown and his story. So we're gonna. It's not a long, long one, 
so this is still good in in thinking what i wanted to do and so um doc south is a site that has a whole lot of the electronic editions so not even having money or kesef is not even even a conversation either because you on the internet is free yes that is free to hop on over to this website which we we read a number of things from here and so this is what we're going to read tonight so without further ado i'm going to answer this one last question here we're going to get started all right the baby brought me the book as well and also what gave me the idea i have this book i'm not all camera ready today but i'm gonna show you guys we're gonna that there's a children's adaptive let me see if i could just i'm not camera ready because i was like nah but I'm, I'm gonna let you guys see the children's book this is the children's book and so with the children's book if you have younger children, it's it's adapted for children. Henry's Freedom Box, a true story from the Underground Railroad. And so the children brought me this. It's, a, it's kind of a sad book, but I like the illustrations. They're really official. And the book is well written. It was written by Ellen Levine and Kadir Nelson. That's who put this book together. So if you have younger ones and you want to be able to have child appropriate conversation with them, this is a good book to read. Henry's Freedom Box. So we're going to read the adult version straight from Henry's mouth. And so let us begin. Narrative of the life of Henry Box Brown, written by himself. Henry Box Brown, 1816. And they got a cover, they got a picture of the front cover of the book. So there was a lot of self-publishing going on and there's a re-emergence of self-publishing. Let's not be afraid to tell our story because how many, this is 1816 and we in 2016. So 1916, 2016, literally 200 years later, shout out, 200 years later, we are reading his story because he took the time to share and prayerfully we'll be able to learn and get some edification from this. So this is literally 200 years um, after this book was published. That's excellent. I mean, this stuff, I don't know about anybody else, but if you're at the site, you can see um, Resurrection of Henry Box Brown at Philadelphia. You can see uh, the uh, there's a pictorial of it and they have him coming out of the box and it says Philadelphia this side up. So narrative of Henry Box Brown written by himself, first English edition. And they have a scan of the first page. Okay. And on the first page it says, forget not the unhappy through sorrow. So though sorrow may annoy, there's something then for memory hereafter to enjoy. Oh, still from fortune's garland, some flowers for others strew. And forget not the unhappy, for ah, their friends share few. And that's, I guess, I'm not sure. I don't even know who wrote the poem, or he just prefaced it with the poem. So it says here, printed, it was printed again by Lynn and Glynn, Lee and Glynn in 1851. So here's the preface. Let me make it bigger so I can see. I, I personally like the physical copies. Cause I can, I can, you know, mark them, do all kind of stuff that I like to do for my studying purposes. But for this purpose, I did not have the physical copy, so I'm gonna go in on the computer. All right. So much has already been written concerning the evils of slavery, and by men so much more able to portray its horrid form than I am, that I might well be excused if I were to remain altogether silent on the subject. But, however, much has been written. How? But much has been written, however much has been said, and however much has been done. I feel impelled by the voice of my own conscience from the recent experience which I had of alarming extent to which the traffic in human beings is carried on, and the cruelties, both bodily and mental, to which men in the condition of slaves are continually subjected and also from the hardening and blasting influences which this traffic produces on the character of those who thus treat as goods and chattel the bodies and souls of their fellows. To add yet one other testimony of protest against the foul blot of the state of morals, of religion, and of cultivation in the American Republic. For I feel convinced that enough has not been written 
Enough has not been said. Enough has not been done. While nearly 4 million of human beings possessing immortal souls are chained in chains, dragged out their existence in the Southern states. They are keenly alive to the heaven born voice of liberty and require the illumination of grace of the almighty G.O.D. Having myself been in the same position, by, but by the blessing of the Most High, having been enabled to snap my chains and escape to a land of liberty, I owe it as a sacred duty to the cause of humanity that I should devote my life to the redemption of my fellow man. The tale of my own suffering is not one of great interest to those who delight to read of hair-breath adventures of tragic occurrences and scenes of blood. My life, even in slavery, has been in many aspects comparatively comfortable. I have experienced a continuance of such kindness as slaveholders have to bestow. But though my body has escaped the lash of the whip, my mind has grown under tortures which I believe will never be related because language is inadequate to express them. But those who know, or those know them who have them to endure. The whip, the cowskin, the gallows, the stocks, the paddle, the prisons, the perversion of stomach, although bloody and barbarous in their nature, have no comparison with those internal pangs which are felt by the soul when the hand of the merciless talent plaques or plucks from one's bosom the object of one's ripened affections. And the darlings who in required parental care confer the sweet sensation of parental bliss. I freely admit I have enjoyed my full share of all those blessings which fall to the lot of a slave's existence. I have felt the sweet influence of friendship's power and the still more delightful glow of love. And had I never heard the name of liberty or seen the tyrant lift his cruel hand to smite my fellow and my friend, I might perhaps have dragged my chains to quietude to the grave and have found a tomb in a slavery polluted land. But thanks be to, he says, G.O.D., I heard the glorious sound and felt its inspiring influence on my heart and have satisfied myself of the value of freedom. I resolved to purchase it whatever should be its price yo his opening is so bomb i don't even know what to say i mean i'm sorry i don't know if anybody else there there felt his preface that's why it looked like don't just skip the preface his preface is awesome but anywho I, i'm feeling that mr henry box brown he was like uh i love a physical copy too okay says um the preface yeah the preface is fire the preface is he, I like what, and then I'm going to go into it, but when he says, at first he's like, you know, everybody's talking, but then he comes back and says, for I feel convinced that enough has not been written, enough has not been said, enough has not been done, while nearly four millions of human beings possessing immortal souls are in chains, dragged out their ex existence in the southern states, because there were actually two mass migrations. There was the initial one brought into this country, but in the initial, there weren't a lot of population in Mississippi, Missouri, Georgia, all Florida, all of these places. And they were actually on the coast in like Virginia, Tennessee, South Carolina, North Carolina, New York, all up against the seaboard. But when these dudes began to find out that, ah, man, cotton became king, tobacco wasn't where it was at, and they began to, they depleted the soil where they were, and so they started to do a mass, a second mass migration, and this is what he's, at this time, this is what he's alluding to, that there's a second mass migration that takes place in this country, where they were literally stealing people, like, twice, like, you stole them the first time, and now you stole them again, and they were separating people and selling them off. And this is was the worst thing that a slave could hear, that they were going to be shipped down south, never to be heard of again. And so that's why the story that we read of, of Charles Ball was on, like not normal, because that's the same thing that happened to Charles. He was taken from Maryland, which is about the areas that they would be, and shipped all the way, if you can remember that story, down to Georgia. And he made it back and was stolen again. And so I'm sorry, that preface was like fire. I got to read it again in my own time. But for the for the sake of time, we're going to proceed here. Um, and I'm glad he wrote it. You know, it says here, introduction, page one. While America is boasting of her freedom and making the world ring with her professions of equality, she holds millions of her inhabitants in bondage. 
This surely must be a wonder to all who seriously reflect on the subject of man holding property in man, in a land of Republican institutions. That slavery in all its phases is demoralizing to everyone concerned. None who may read the following narrative can for a moment doubt, in my opinion, unless the Americans purge themselves of this thing, which they have not, they will have to undergo very severe, if not protracting suffering, which is happening. It is, this is prophetic, this is 200 years ago. It is not at all unlike that the great unsettledness which of a late has attached to the price of cotton. See, this is when cotton switched over, cotton became king. The very unsatisfactory circumstance of that slaveholding continent being the principal field employed in the production of that vegetable by the dealing in and the manufacture of which such astonishing fortunes have been amassed that everybody was eating. Everybody was eating off of wearing fancy clothes and this and that, but I digress, will lead to arrangements being entered into through the operation of which the bondmen will be made free. The popular mind is in every land becoming impatient of its chains, and soon the American captives will be made to taste of that freedom, which by right belongs to men. The manner in which this mighty change will be accomplished may not be at present understood, but with the most high all things are possible, I don't be getting down, I don't be saying L-O-R-D, so, you know, Henry Box Brown, I understood where you was at, so, you know, I'm just going to transpose that for anybody who's asking. It may be that the very means which are being used by those who wish to perpetuate slavery and to recapture those who have by any plans not approved of by those dealing in human flesh become free will be amongst the instruments which the most I will employ to overturn the whole system. Another means which in above, sorry, in addition to the above, we think will contribute to the accomplishment of this desirable object, the destruction of slavery, is the simple but natural narratives of those who have been long under the yoke themselves. And this was, again, that's why we have so many narratives that we are not paying much attention to. But in this day, this is what the abolitionists were using. These, the slave narratives were a very popular um, literature you know, and, and Harris Beecher Stowe was a European. She wrote, you know, one of the most, uh, what do you call it? Infamous slave narratives. And she wasn't even a slave. You understand? So many slaves, that's why he said many people endeavor to write this, but it's not enough. So I'm going to tell my story. He says, it is a, lament a lamentable fact that some ministers of religion are contaminated with the foulness of slavery. Those men in the Southern states who ascend the pulpit to proclaim the world's jubilee are themselves in fearful numbers, the holders of slaves. When we reflect on the bar which slavery constituted to the advancement of these objects at one time contemplated by the almost defunct evangelical alliance, quote unquote, when we consider the great being who beheld the Israelites in their captivity and beholding came down to deliver them is the still the same have we not reason to believe that he will in his providence raise up another Moses to guide the now enslaved sons of Ham to privileges which humanity, irrespective of color or clime, is always at liberty to demand? And I, I find that interesting like he, how he alludes to them being Israelites, but then he calls, or whoever is doing the introduction calls, and I don't think it's him writing the introduction because in the preface, he's writing in the first person in the introduction whoever's writing the introduction is not writing in the first person. So I don't think it's him writing in the first, I don't think it's him writing the introduction, but let me continue here. It says, give me one second, one, one, one second, one second. All right. All right. So it says here, where are we? It says, while the British mind retained its antipath antipathy to slavery in all its kinds and sent forth its waves of audible, audibly expressed opinion on the subject, that opinion meeting one nearly allied in character to itself in the Northern States. And while both unite intending towards the South, 
the reiterated demand for an honest acting one those turgid profession yo they be giving you some definitions to go look up turgid i know y'all out there help me out turgid t-u-r-g-i-d one of those turgid profession of equality pe peculiar to all american proceedings and everything but slavery so y'all looking for just weights and balances and everything but this area so he's calling out everybody he says the southern states must yield to the pressure from without even the slaves will feel themselves growing beyond the dimension which their chains can enclose and backed by the roar of the british lion and supported by northern americans in their just demand for emancipation the long downtrodden and despised bondmen will arise and by a united voice assert their title to freedom it may be that the subject of the following narrative has a mission from god see i knew it i knew he didn't write this this part right here um mission from god to the human family certainly the deliverance of moses from the destruction of the nile was scarcely more marvelous than than was the deliverance of mr henry box brown from the horrors of slavery for any lengthy observance or observations by which the reader will be detained from the subject of the following pages there can be no necessity whatever mr brown was conveyed from Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia in a box three feet long and two feet six inches deep. Remember, again, if you watched Underground, this is something that they wrote into the story. We have to know what we're seeing. 40, for 27 hours, he was enclosed in this box. The following copy of a letter, which was written by the gentleman to whom it was directed, will explain this part of the subject. And then this is all in the introduction. It says, copy of a letter respecting Henry Brown, Henry Box Brown's escape from slavery, a verification of Patrick Henry's speech in Virginia legislature, March 1775, when he said, give me liberty or give me death. So it's, it's dated Philadelphia, March 26, 1849. Dear, here is a man who has been the hero of one of the most extraordinary achievements I ever heard of. He came to me on Saturday morning last in a box tightly hooped marked this side up by overland express from the city of richmond did you ever hear of anything in all your life to beat that nothing that was done on the barricades of paris exceeded this cool and deliberate intrepidity to appreciate fully the boldness and risk of the achievement you ought to see the box and hear all the circumstances the box is in the clear three feet one inch long two feet six inches deep and two feet wide it was a regular old store box such as you see in pearl street it was grooved at the points and braced at the ends leaving but the very slightest crevice to admit the air nothing saved him from suffocation but the free use of water a quantity of which he took in with with him in a beef's bladder <laughs> which he, he bathed his face and the constant fanning of himself with his hat he fanned himself unremittingly all the time the this side up on the box was not regarded and he was twice put with his head downward resting with the back against the end of the box his feet braced against the other and the first time he succeeded in shifting his position but the second time was on board of the steamboat where people were sitting and standing about the box and where any motion inside would have been an overheard and have led to discovery he was therefore obliged to keep his position for 20 miles this nearly killed him. He says the veins in his temple was as thick as his finger. I had been expecting him for several days and was in mortal fear all the time lest his arrival should be only be a signal for calling in the coroner. You can better imagine that I described my sensations when in answer to my rap on the box in question, all right, we'll see a noble looking fellow. He will tell you the whole story. Please send him on to Mr. McGleveland, Boston, with this letter to save me the time it would take to write another. He was boxed up in Richmond at 5 a.m. on Friday, shipped at 8, and I opened him at 6 about daylight next morning. He has a sister in New Bedford. Yours truly, M. McRoy. So he is having, this is the witnesses who saying, yes, I received him. And this is this story is true. So you have a European putting basically their stamp of approval on this story. 
So let's let's go ahead with the story. Turgid, swollen, descended, distended, or congested. A language of style, tediously pompous or bombastic. Thank you. That's one of my new words, then. <laughs> ah, tediously pompous or bombastic. Very interesting. I like I like strange sounding words. I mean, you don't really hear that word used, you know, in normal uh conversation today. And so thank you so much for that, sister. That was Sister Tish. Thank you for that, Sister Tish. It says the report of Mr. Brown's escape spread far and wide so that he was introduced to the anti-slavery society in Philadelphia from the office of which society, a letter of which the following a copy was written. Anti-slavery office, Philadelphia, April 8th, 1850. H. Box Brown. So everybody is writing. This is like a press release. Everybody, everybody is telling his story. OK, so this is all that we get before we even could get to his story. So let's read the raving reviews or reviews of Henry Box Brown. It says, my dear sir, I was pleased to learn by your letter that it was your purpose to publish a narrative of the circumstance of your escape from slavery. Such a publication, I should think, would not only be highly interesting, but well adapted to help on the cause of anti-slavery. Facts of this kind illustrate without comment the cruelty of the slave system, the fitness of its victims for freedom, and the game time. And at the game time, I think he means same time, the guilt of the nation that tolerates its existence. As one privy to many of the circumstances of your escape, I consider it one of the most remarkable exploits on record that a man should come all the way from Richmond to Pennsylvania by the overland route packed up in a box three feet long by two and a half feet wide and deep with scarcely a perceptible crevice for the admission of fresh air and subject at that time to the rough handling and frequent shiftings of other freight, and he should reach his destination alive, is a tale scarcely to be believed on the most irresistible testimony. I confess if I had not myself been present at the opening of the box on its arrival, and had not witnessed with my own eyes your resurrection from your living tomb, I should have been strongly disposed to question the truth of the story. As it was, however, seeing was believing, and believing was with me at, le at least, to be impressed with the diabolical character of American slavery. But nobody wants to talk about slavery all of a sudden now. Let's not talk about it, it's over. No, it's not. And the obligation that rests upon everyone to labor for its overthrow, which we still dealing with the residuals even until this day. Trusting that, this, I'm sorry, that was a moon and not, not J. F. McKim. It says, trusting that this may be the impression produced by your narrative, whatever it is read, and that it may be read whatever the evils of slavery are felt, I remain. Your friend truly, J. McKim. Understand J. McKim? It's probably a European. And so he has another, uh, he has another one. It says, were Mr. Brown in quest of an apology for publishing the following narrative, the letter of Mr. McKim would form that apology. The narrative was published in America and an addition of 8,000 copies sold in about two months. I'm not mad at you, Henry Box Brown. He was doing his thing. And back in 1800, my boy moved 8,000 copies. Do your thing. Such was the interest excited by the astounding revelations made by Mr. Brown as to the real character of slavery and the, hypo the hypocrisy of those professors of religion who have any connection with its infernal proceedings. Several ministers of religion, religion took a great interest in Mr. Brown and did what they could to bring the subject of his escape properly before the public. The Reverend Mick Spaulding of Dover, New Hampshire, was at the trouble to write to the two of his brethren in the ministry a letter, of which the following is a copy. The testimonials subjoining Mr. Spaulding's letter was given by persons who witnessed the exhibition. To the Reverend Mezzo Pike and Brooks, Dover, 12 July, 1850. Dear brethren, a colored gentleman, Mr. H.B. Brown, proposes to visit your village for the purpose of exhibiting his splendid pan panorama or mirror of slavery. I had the pleasure of seeing it, and I'm prepared to say for what I have myself seen and known in times past of slavery and of the slave trade, in my opinion, it is almost, if not quite, a perfect facsimile of the workings of that horrible and fiendish system. The re uh, yeah, don't mind me, because you know he sounds like he would talk like that, so. Please forgive me. <laughs> it says, 
um, where am I? Fiendish system. The real life like scenes presented in this panorama are admirably calculated to make an unfading impression upon the heart and memory, such as no lectures, books, or colloquial correspondences can produce, especially on the minds of children and young people who should ever where be brought before the altar of Hannibal to swear eternal hate to slavery and love of rational freedom. If you can spare the time to witness the exhibition, I'm quite certain you will feel yourself amply rewarded. I know very well there are a great many imposters and cheats going about the country through the, the country deceiving and picking up the people's money, but this is of another class together. Yours very truly, Justin Spaulding. And then the person says, Another person says, I hereby certify that I have attended the exhibition of Henry Bach's Brown Panorama in this village with very deepest interest and most cordial subscribe my name as an expression of my full concurrence with the sentiment of the, the recommendation above, A. Lathman. My boy got some testimonials. I agree cordially in the above testimonials, A. Calvierno. I am not an experienced judge in paintings of this kind, but I'm only surprised that this is so well done and so much of it true to the life. Oliver Aya Parper of Franklin Street Baptist Minister. And then we're gonna soon get to the beginning. This is all before we get to the beginning. Dover, NH, July 15, 1850. Although the following letter as to the date should have occupied a place before the others as it was addressed to the public, and not to any particular person, its present position will answer every purpose of its publication, Syracuse, April 26, 1850. It says, to the public, there are few facts connected with the terrible history of American slavery that will be longer remembered than that a man escaped from a house of bondage by coming from Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia in a box three feet, one inch long, two feet wide, and two feet, six inches deep. 27 hours, he was closely packed within those small dimensions and was tumbled along on drays, railroad cars, steamboats, and horse carts, as any other box of merchandise would have been, sometimes on his feet, sometimes on his side, and once for about an hour or two actually on his head. Such is the well-attested fact, and this volume contains the biography of the remarkable man, Henry Box Brown, who thus attained his freedom. Is there a man in our country who deserves who better deserves his liberty? And is there to be found in these Northern states an individual base enough to assist in returning him to slavery or to stand quietly by and consent to his recapture? The narrative of such a man cannot fail to be interesting. And I cordially commend it to all who love liberty and hate oppression, Samuel J. May. After Mr. Brown's arrival in the free states and the recovery of his health, in addition to the publishing of his narrative, he began to prepare the panorama, which has been exhibited with such success both in America and England, January 1851. It says, we the teachers of St. John's Sunday School, Blackburn, have seen the exhibition in the schoolroom called the Panorama of American Slavery. I gotta look that up. I wanna know what was in the panorama, hold up. Not now, that's just for my side note. They keep calling it the panorama. So maybe they have something about that. It says, feel it our duty to call upon all our, he says, Christian brethren who may have an opportunity to go and witness the great mirror of slavery for themselves. Sorry. Feeling assured ourselves that it is calculated to leave a lasting impression upon the mind and particularly that of the young. We recommend it more, especially on account of the exhibitor, Mr. Henry Box Brown, being himself a fugitive, slave and therefore able to give a true account of the horrors of American slavery together with his own miraculous escape. And this joint was signed by 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and I'm going to almost be willing to bet Europeans. Mr. Brown continued to travel in the United States until the Fugitive Slave Bill, which passed into law last year. And again, this would have been is 1851, right? It says, rendered it necessary for him to seek asylum on British ground. Such was the vigilance with which the search for victims was pursued that Mr. Brown had to travel under an assumed name and by the most secret means, shift his panorama to prevent suspicion and capture. Thomas G. Lee, minister of Windsor Chapel. And we also know that happened to Frederick Douglass as well. 
Like Frederick Douglass published his narrative. The joint went wild, you know, and they tried to come for him. So I, if I'm not mistaken, he went over to Canada and tried to hide out for a minute because the block was hot. Like they were, they were like adamant about not, and we read that in our last narrative, they were selling off slaves, selling them down South. They were adamant about not uh, letting them go, let's say. And so they were went to serious means to try to track people down and bring them back into their slavery. So let us start. We said all of that to say that this was a well-known narrative. All of the Europeans, he, he was very famous. Um, he was very famous. And this is how, when we go back and look into, when we go back and look into, um, what I was gonna say, when we go back and look into what we just saw in the left, not the left project, the underground, we see that they changed the narrative a little bit, used the story, but made it like he had a wife in the box. So now the, him and the wife tried to ship themselves to freedom, but the man, he he uh, lived and the woman died. So they, they, they took their creative license, let's say, to the story. Narrative of the life of Henry Box Brown, chapter one. It says, and we're probably gonna have to break it up in two. It's not a very long one, but eh, we'll see. I think we're probably gonna have to break it up in two. All right. It says, I was born about 45 miles from the city of Richmond in Louisiana County in the year of 1815. I entered the world a slave in the midst of a country whose most honored writings declared that all men have a right to liberty, but had imprinted upon my body no mark which could be made to signify that my destiny was to be that of a bondman. Neither was there an angel, any angel stood by at the hour of my birth to hand my body over by the authority of heaven to be property of a fellow man. No, but I was a slave because my countrymen had made it lawful. In utter contempt of the declared will of heaven for the strong to lay hold of the weak and to buy and to sell them as marketable goods. Thus I was I born a slave. Tyrants, remorseless, destitute of religion and every principle of humanity, stood by the couch of my mother, and as I entered into the world, before I had done anything to forfeit my right to liberty, and while my soul was yet undefiled by the commission of actual sin, stretched forth their bloody arms and branded me with the mark of bondage. And he's so poetic. Man, Mr. Box Brown, man, your words just flow like, oh, I'm sorry. And by such means, I became their own property. Yes, they robbed me of myself before I could know the nature of their wicked arts. And even afterwards, until I forcibly wrenched, wrenched myself from their hands, did they retain their stolen property. My father and mother, of course, were then slaves, but both of them are now enjoying such a measure of liberty as the law affords to those who have made recompense to the tyrant for the right of property he holds in his fellow man. It was not my fortune to be long under my mother's care, but I still possess a vivid recollection of her affectionate oversight. Such lessons as the following she would frequently give me. She would take me up on, upon her knee and pointing to the forest and trees, which were then being stripped of their foliage by the winds of autumn, would say to me, my son, as yonder leaves are stripped from off the trees of the forest, so are the children of the slaves swept away from them by the hands of cruel tyrants. And her voice would tremble and she would seem almost choked with her deep emotion while the tears would find their way down her saddened cheeks. On those occasions, she fondly pressed me to her heavy even bosom as if to save me from a so dreaded a calamity or to feast on the enjoyments of the maternal feeling while she yet retained possession of her child. I was then young, but I well recollect the sadness of her countenance and the mournful sacredness of her words as they impressed themselves upon my youthful mind never to be forgotten. Oh man, this man is, uh, you know, he, anywho, Martin, note to self, mothers of the North, as you gaze upon the fair forms of your idolized little ones, just pause for a moment. How would you feel if you knew that at any time the will of a tyrant who neither could nor would sympathize with your domestic feelings might separate them from 
ever from your embrace, not to be laid in the silent grave where the wicked cease from troubling and where the weary are at rest, rest, but to live under the dominion of tyrants and avarice men whose cold hearts cannot sympathize with your feelings, but who will mock at any manifestation of tenderness and scourge them to satisfy the cruelty of their own disposition. Yet such condition, such is the condition of hundreds of thousands of mothers in Southern states of America. My mother used to instruct me in the principles of morality according to her own notion of what was good and pure. She said, he says, but I had no means of acquiring proper conception of religion in the state of slavery, where all those who profess to be followers, he says of J Jesus Christ, evince more of the disposition of demons than of men and is really a matter of wonder to me now considering the character of my position that i did not imbibe imbibe a strong and lasting hatred of everything pertaining to the religion of christ my lessons in morality were of the most simple kind i was not to steal not to tell lies and to behave myself in a becoming manner towards everybody my mother, although a slave, took great delight in watching the result of her moral training in the character of my brother and myself. Whilst whether successful or unsuccessful in the form of superior habits in us, it is not for me to say. There was sown for her a blissful remembrance in the minds of her children, which we cherish both by the bond and the free as long as life shall last. And the preface opens up and this is where you hear him saying that those who claim that they're quote unquote Christians are the ones who are, are propagating this, this uh, or meeting out this torture and, and furthering. And we see that illustrated in the series that we just saw finished where the slave master not, was listening to uh, the advice of the guy who the the the, the, the supposed uh, minister who calls uh, Ernestine a Jezebel, and so he listens to him and he's listening to the people around him. This is how he ends up lynching Sam. And so Henry Box Brown is like, I see these dudes. These are the same dudes who was like saying, you know, oh mercy, mercy, and they have no mercy. And so I just find that interesting that he's expressing that sentiment. He says, as a specimen of the religious knowledge of the slave i may here state that there that where where my pat where my impression in regard to my master assuring the reader that i'm not joking but stating that were the opinions of all slave children on my master's plantation so that some judgment may be formed of the care which was taken of our religious instruction i really believe my old master was almighty god and the young master was jc or jesus christ this is very interesting because I've read that before where they say, you didn't come here to serve God. You came here to serve me, you know? Um, and when they say, you know, they want to serve, they're like, no, 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 we brought you here to serve us. And so he's saying on his plantation, he thought that his master was the almighty and the master's son was the son, which is wow. A note to self on page four. The reason of this error seems to have been that we were taught to believe thunder to be the voice of G.O.D. And when it was about to thunder, my old master would approach us. If we were in the yard and say, all you children run into the house now for it's going to thunder. And after the thunderstorm was over, he would approach us smilingly and say, what a fine shower we had. And bidding us look at the flowers would observe how prettily they appeared. We children seeing this so frequent, could not avoid the idea that it was he that thundered and made the rain to fall in order to make his flowers look beautiful. And I was nearly eight years of age before I got rid of this childish superstition. Our master was common, uncommonly kind, for even a slave master may be kind. And as he moved about in his dignity, he seemed like a, a, a G or a power to us, a small G-O-D, he says. But notwithstanding his kindness, although he knew very well that superstitious notions were formed, we formed him, he never made the least attempt to correct our erroneous impression, but rather seemed pleased with the reverential feelings which we entertained towards him. All the young slave called his son savior. They are OD and what in the world? And the manner in which I was undeceived was as follows. One Sabbath at the preaching time, my mother told my father of a woman who wished to join the church. She had told the preacher that she had been baptized by one of the slaves at night. 
a practice which is quite common. After they went from their work to the minister, he asked her if she believed that our Savior came in the world and had died for the sins of men. And she said, yes. I was listening anxiously to the conversation. And when my mother had finished, I asked her if my young master was not the Savior who the woman said was dead. She said he was not, but it was our Savior in heaven. I then asked her if there was a Savior there too. And she told me that young master was not our Savior, which astonished me very much. I then asked her if old master was not he, <laughs> to which she replied he was not, and began to instruct me more fully in reverent or reference to the power or G.O.D. of heaven. After this, I believed there was a G.O.D. who ruled the world, but I did not previously entertain the least idea of any such being. And however dangerous my former notions were, they were not at all out of keeping with the blasphemous teachings of the Hellenist system of slavery. That is that is that is kind of quite interesting. It says, "Oh man, his writing. He spoke of his mother and described everything." Yes, usually a lot of times when we're reading a, a masculine narrative, some and I'm going to get a, another feminine narrative, but he gives he is quite descriptive in his recallings, and and that's well appreciated. And she said, "The thunder as the voice who was the master in the south, he will state." The thunder is the most side he would go into the house. Some of us growing up had to be quiet. Yeah, turn off the TV, plug out the phone. You know, um, that's the statistician. Yeah, they, they will require all of these things in association with whether it be the light going out or whatever the case may be. But I find that interesting that he lived in his ignorance. He says, I believe that he said till he was around eight years old, that he was led to believe this for so long. It says, one of my sisters became anxious to have her soul converted and for this purpose had the hair cut from her head because it is a notion which prevails amongst the slaves that unless the hair be cut, the soul cannot be converted. My mother reproved her for this and told her that she must pray to G.O.D. who dwelled in heaven and who only could convert her soul and say if she wished to renounce the sins of the world, she would recollect that it was not by outside show such as the cutting of hair that G.O.D. measured the worthiness or unworthiness of his servants. Only ask him, she said, with a humble heart, forsaking your sins and obedience to his divine commandment. And whatever mercy is most fitting for your condition, he will graciously bestow. While quite a lad of my principal employment was waiting upon my master and mistress, and at intervals taking lessons in various kinds of work, which was carried out on the plantation, I have often there where the hot sun sent forth its scorching rays upon my tender head, look forward with dismay to the time when I, like my fellow slaves, would be driven by the taskmaster's cruel lash to separate from my parents and all my present associates, to toil without regard and to suffer cruelty as, as yet unknown. The slave has always the harrowing idea before him, however kindly he may be treated for the time being that the auctioneer must soon set him up for public sale and knock him down as the property of the person who, whether man or demon, would pay his master the greatest number of dollars for his body. That's the ending of chapter one. Oh man, you know, there, there are things that were left on record uh, in the book of in the book of Deuteronomy, a lot of people ask what, and I've said this before, what is this? How do you read it? How do you keep a level head? You know, but the lens of which I'm looking through, it's good to hear the narratives. And it's also good to begin to get an understanding of how our people and other peoples, because there were many peoples represented within this institution here in the West, got in this position. When we talk about universal law and principle and how did we get on the bad side of this conversation and how did someone who was wicked rise up over you? What was going on in the earth? What was going on within your culture, within your people that allowed like this weakening? It's like an immune system. You know, when somebody comes down with something, a cold and they run down their immune system, they're more susceptible. So somewhere along the line, our spiritual immune system had to have been compromised to allow such an infectious. And people will say, oh, Muna, I don't agree. But this is how I process what it is that I'm hearing where I process it in the light of oftentimes spiritual, spiritual law. And um, we could definitely talk about it. But let me go ahead and read another chapter. It says chapter two. My brother and myself were in the habit 
of carrying grain to the mill a few times in the year, which was the means of furnishing us with some information respecting other slaves. Otherwise, otherwise, we would have known nothing whatever of what was going on anywhere in the world, excepting on our master's plantation. That's still true today. We don't know. We don't know what's going on outside of Brooklyn, or we don't know what's going outside our, our little hood. You know, we don't get out. We don't know what's going on, and and you know that's not good. It says the mill was situated at a distance of tw about twenty miles from our residence and belonged to Colonel Ambler in Yansville County. On these occasions, we used to acquire some little knowledge of what was going on around us. And we neglected no opportunity of making ourselves acquainted with the condition of other slaves. On one occasion, while waiting for grain, we entered a house in the neighborhood. And while resting ourselves there, we saw a number of forlorn looking being past the door. As they passed, we noticed they grazed earnestly upon us or gazed. Afterwards, about 50 did the very same. And we heard some of them remarking that we had shoes, vests, and hats. We felt a desire to talk with them, and accordingly, after receiving some bread and meat from the mistress of the house, we followed those abject beings to their quarters, and such a sight we had never witnessed before, as we had always lived on our master's plantation, and this was the first of our journeys to the mill. These slaves were dressed in shirts made of coarse bagging, such as coffee sacks are made from, and some kind of light substance for pantaloons and this was all their clothing they had no shoes hats vests or coats and when my brother spoke of their poor clothing they said they had never before seen colored people dressed as we were they looked very hungry and we divided our bread and meat among them they said they never had any meat given them by their master my brother put various questions to them such as if they had wives did they go to church etc they said they had wives but were obliged to marry persons who worked on the same plantation as the master would not allow them to take wives from other plantations consequently they were all related to each other o d okay i'm sorry okay let me continue and the master obliged them to marry their relatives or to remain single when okay let me finish my brother asked me of one of them to show him his sisters he said he could not distinguish them from the rest as they were all his sisters although the slaves themselves entertain considerable respect for the law of marriage as a moral principle and are exceedingly well pleased when they can obtain the service of a minister in the performance of a ceremony yet the law recognizes no right in slaves to marry at all i want to step right here for a minute because there is something Peace, peace, King Son. What's the narrative? Okay, I see Henry Box Brown. Yes, I agree with your assessment. We have to tend to Torah, but we also have to peep what's brewing around us in a contemporary sense. I agree. Examine ancient history, but check what's going on now in immediate history. And this is not that ancient. What I was saying, other than thanks for that, King Son. What I'm saying is we're dealing with the residuals. We're still dealing when when we think it's gone, what we're seeing the manifestation of what was. But because we think we have so far come along and we're so far removed from this, I'm not even going all the way back. I'm talking, like he said, he's born in 1815. So in 200 years ago, when they didn't have any shame, when it wasn't hidden, when they were very forthcoming with their objectives, it's good to understand the nature of the, the people like to say the beast, but the nature of the people who we're dealing with. And a lot of our people have forgotten and they have forgotten because they don't know the history. So I agree, we have to look at now, but if we don't know where we're coming from, we don't know where we've been, we don't know these type of stories. And I wanted to stop here because what we just read in chapter two is what we see a lot of times that people say, hey, they were molested by their, that by their uncles, by their fathers, by the X, Y, and Z. But what we're reading here is this inbreeding. And he said, show me who are your sisters. He said, I can't, they're all my sisters and he won't let us leave this plantation. And so the master propagated inbreeding. And so this is in the DNA. This is the, in the epigenetics of the individual of this mass amount of people. And now this is what comes up generations later. But if we didn't know that this was going on, I remember there was a man, I don't remember if it was a documentary or what I was watching, but the man, the man said, he noticed that a lot of women in Maryland 
were in jail. And when he asked them what they was in jail for, he said they was in jail for beating or killing one of their family members who violated them. And when he began to look at the history, just like we're reading here, that this practice of this plantation, wait a minute, what's the name of the plantation? Let me go back. Colonel Amber. I'm about to look it up. Colonel, not, I'm, that's my homework. Colonel Amber in Yansville County, he's saying that, yo, this, this man had this practice. Now, how many slaves was on his plantation? And how many people did he do that to? And who are the children and the great-grandchildren of these people? So that's wild right there. That, oh, okay, that's what's up. So this dude was heavily into this, which is it's demonic, man. Okay. The relation of husband and wife, parent and child, only exists by the toleration of their master, who may insult the slave's wife, violate her person at any moment, and there is no law to punish him for what he has done. Because again, at this time, you could not rape a slave. You cannot, a woman could not be raped. This was on their, 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 their law books that you could not rape a female slave. She was unrapeable, if you could imagine. And when you see today, the contrast between if somebody says a European was defiled and a, and a so-called black woman was defiled, you're gonna get a different response. Reason being, these are the same people in this space and, space and time that had these same thoughts. They just had to hide a little bit. You know, they had to change it up to make it kinda, to make it kinda acceptable. So it says here, uh, now this not only may be as, and I'm for all those who are reading along, I'm on page nine of, and I put, the, I put the article in the box. Now this not only may be as I have said, but it actually is the case to an alarming extent. And it is my candid opinion that one of the strongest motives which operate upon the slaveholders in inducing them to maintain their iron grasp upon the unfortunate slaves is because it gives them such unlimited control over the persons of their female slaves. The greater part of the slaveholders are licentious men and the most respectable and kind masters keep some of these slaves as mistresses. It is for their pecuniary interest to do so as their progeny is equal to so many dollars and cents in their pockets instead of being source of expense to them, as would be the case if the slaves were free. Again, we saw that again in the underground that we just read, watched, it just finished, Ernestine, uh, her, her, um, uh, Rosalie, and the young boy was for the master. And those were, and he had them still as slaves, as servants. So they would breed the women and still, because the condition of the child follows that of the mother, the child is still property. You could sell the child off. You could do whatever you want to do and, and earn from that. It's crazy. But anywho, it is a horrible idea, but it is no less true that no slave husband has any certainty whatever of being able to retain his wife a single hour. Neither has any wife any more certainty of her husband. Their fondest affection may be utterly disregarded and their devoted attachment cruelly ignored at any moment a brutal slaveholder may think fit. Okay, the, is the issues between the so-called black man and black woman is stemming from these places. So how important is this stuff at this place in time? Um. I always thought anything went, nothing was off limits on the plantation. Yeah, rape, they, rape, rape, rape was forbidden for the white woman. Rape was not forbidden for the, for, because you were property in their mind, rape was not a, something that was punishable by crime. As a matter of fact, let me see if I could get it for you. They claimed you couldn't rape her. She was unrapeable. And so there was a woman named Elizabeth Keys where the um in virginia where the court system said you know what because she wanted to fight for her freedom she went to court and won so once they changed the law to say that the condition of the the child follows that of the mother it gave them free reign to go around violating women because no one would hold them accountable for these mixed breed children so this is alicia key alicia keys elizabeth key this is her story and then we'll begin, and there's another story called um, Cecilia. And Cecilia was being raped by her slave master and she took it into her own hands and she couldn't take it anymore. And so she dealt with him, let's just say. And 
they took her to court and to charge her for murder. And so regardless of the fact, and that's where they came with this conclusion that you're a slave, so you couldn't be raped. And that the name of that is Cecilia. Hold up. Cecilia the slave. So we have to understand when we see in the situation with Bill Cosby today, when 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 all of these people coming out, when you look at the mass majority of the people coming out, you see who it is. It's Europeans, the mass majority of the people are saying, you did this to me. And and the people are taking it or standing at attention. Uh, let me let me give you guys this thing here. So the, the thought process is still there, it's still alive and kicking. Um yeah, not Alicia Keys. It's uh I said Alicia Keys, her name is Elizabeth Keys. Yeah, you still property even with your white daddy, agreed, King's son. So this is this is the two people I was talking about. This was like a um, a case in Missouri, um, and this was a case in Missouri with a, a 19 year old slave girl named Cecilia. And this is where the conversation they began to have the conversation because the man was violating her over and over again, and she could. And guess what? They also took Cecilia's story. This is why it's very interesting that we need to know this. In underground, Rosalie is on the run. Why is she on the run? Because the overseer was looking to violate her. And she took a bottle and she hit him and he died. This is the story in Cecilia, but Cecilia planned it. Cecilia's like, do come in here one more time. I'm going to deal with him. And so they also took a piece of that Cecilia story. So understand when we're watching this understand what we're watching is not just entertainment they went and did their research and we should do the same and so you could check out those two things and then we're going to finish chapter two, chapter two and then we'll come back for chapter three tomorrow 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 or thursday um where are we at thank you so much for the conversation it's good stuff it's good stuff but what, 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 what okay it says yeah, so I was saying that the issue between the man and the woman is, is from where you have stripped of your roles. He, he's talking about his mother having to prep him at a very early age that this is what's going to happen to you. So just be prepared. That's a mother having to disconnect her feelings from her progeny because they know this is going to. That's a father having to understand that you can't help this person uh, we read other narratives where that they said they had to just they would gladly get out the way so that they wouldn't get hurt they wouldn't get sold they wouldn't get whatever it is that the slave master whatever kind of violent cruelty um that the creator said this of these people of fierce countenance they have no regard regard for the elder or for the young and we are seeing this manifested in this conversation so this colonel ambler i'm gonna see if i can look him up because this dude was into inbreeding but it says the slaves on Colonel Amber's plantation were never allowed to attend church, but were left to manage their religious affairs in their own way. So this is, again, for me, for people who keep saying the slave master made you go to church. This is not, it's not across the board. We need to stop saying this stuff. It's not across the board. Each one had their own little way of which they ran things. Like he said, his slave master never abused him. He gave him clothes and shoes and hats. He went to Colonel Amber's plantation. That's not the same situation there. So we need to start repeating these misnomers um, and this stuff to, you know, keep saying that this is what it was across the board because it wasn't. Now in Haiti, while under French, the regime mixed breeds own slave just slightly off the topic. I can't with King Sun. King Sun, we're gonna have to come back. I know, I know there's some Haitian narratives. Well, I can't even get out of these, but I definitely know there's many narratives that we have to take a look at. That's why I was going to look at, um, I was going to look at, uh, not Tucson Overture. I was going to look at, um, uh, Elado Equiano, but I, I said, let's, let's do a few of these first and then, and then we go. So, you know, there's definitely different, there's Brazilian stories, there's stories that's coming from all about. Since you have to do a video talking, speaking on the intermarriage in between slave masters and the rampant sexual abuse in our communities. Yeah, to see the connection. It is mind blowing. The epigenetics is still there. It's still there because um, this is what you were bred to do. It's like if somebody is born and bred to be a tennis player or a golf player or a basketball player, don't be surprised when they they excel at tennis, basketball, or whatever it is. So if somebody is inbred to, if somebody is, yes, this is what I'm saying. For many, we, we don't understand that there is, a, there is a divinity to it because everything 
it was just exasperated. Many of the things that the European or all of those who were complicit in it, because it wasn't only just the Europeans, so let me say that, but many things that people were complicit with, people on the other side were also complicit. So the, the iniquities rested upon the children who, when they were born, they didn't know what this was about. It's No, it's here. Let me give it to you. It's right here. What, what Henry Box Brown? The, not, the, um, the link is right here. The link is right here, King Son. No problem. You're good. Here's the link right here. You could click on the link and then follow along. The link is right there. But uh, oh man, we haven't done this in so long. I'm over here, you know. Okay, let me, let me, let me, okay. Um, it says the slaves on Colonel Amber's plantation were not allowed to attend church. The reason, and I just have to say this, I'm sorry, I keep stopping, but the reason why they really began to get on them about church was again, as we're reading, the abolitionists were getting wind of all of this stuff. And so a lot of these Southern Europeans, they felt pressured to give their child, their church, their, their slaves, quote unquote, religion or religion. This wasn't their initial desire. This was trying to show the other people, see, we're not that bad. We're actually sharing GOD with them. So this is to be remembered. And this is way later on in the conversation. It says he left them to manage their own religious affairs in their own way. An old slave whom they called John decided on their religious profession and would baptize the approved parties during the silent watches of the night while their master was asleep. We might have got information on many things from these slaves of Colonel Amber, Ambler, but while we were thus engaging, we perceived the overseer directing his steps toward us like a bear for its prey. We had however time to ask one of them if they were ever whipped to which he replied that not a day passed over their heads without some of one being brutally punished and said he we shall have to suffer for this talk with you it was but this morning check it out today if too many melanated people gather in a conversation it is a threat to the so-called system of racism, right supremacy. So did you, there, there is something instilled from this time and beyond that if I catch you fraternizing and looking like you wanna insurrect and having conversations with your brothers and sisters, that is, so don't think that it's just only internal that we can't get along. Like he said, this dude is coming and just for him seeing me talking to you, we are probably gonna catch it again. He says he continued that many of us were severely whipped for having been baptized the night before. And after we left them, we heard the screams of these poor creatures while they were suffering under the blows of the hard treatment received from the overseer for the crime, as we supposed, of talking with us. Yep. The crime was... That's why I love to read there. Listen, no video, no anything could, um, no documentary can replace us just reading. Us just reading the value is, it, it, it's, it's unmeasurable. And this is why I do and, and keep, you know, stressing the importance because there are things in the words that as we read through them together and have this conversation together, we can glean. To understand it's not a figment of your imagination. Too many of you Negroes is at the water cooler. What are you talking about? This mentality is still here. And like King Sun said, you reading and you're writing? They get nervous. Understand it's a fear because you know that you're doing something wrong. So he says he thinks that they got whipped for the fit for, for the crime of talking to them. Meaning now you have criminalized communication one to another. Today, it's still criminal. If you put too many melanated people together, there's going to be some friction. And I tell you, I went out to, you can go out to where you see these Europeans sitting down. They can be having a, a conversation of which you disagree. And it's not all of them, but there's some. And you will not, they're, they're talking there. And there is no, there isn't this whole hoopla. They, they're able to, they're, they're, they're um, social skills or their social abilities were never disrupted in the ways that ours were. Ours were totally disrupted. You were not allowed to do any fraternizing. In this case, you were not allowed to 
have any quote unquote religious um, anything about yourself. So understand that slavery did a number in many, many ways. But um, let me finish here because this, this Harry Box Brown got me turned up. But um, anywho, it says here, he says, for the crime, as we suppose, of talking to us. We felt thankful that we were exempted from such treatment, but we had no certainty that we should not ere long be placed in a similar position. On returning to the mill, we met a young man, a relation of the owner of this plantation, who for some time bad been eyeing us very attentively. We at length asked, he at length asked us if we had ever been whipped. And when I told him we had not, he replied, well, neither of you will ever be of any value. Seriously, he expressed a good deal of surprise that we were allowed to wear hats and shoes, supposing that slaves had no business to wear such clothing as their master wore. Now, check it out. This is why oftentimes, even when quote unquote Negroes are broke or so-called black people are broke or they get a little money, the first thing they go for is the master's clothes. Why? Because you were never allowed to wear it. You didn't feel like you were good enough. And so the first thing they go for was these shoes, these material possessions, because that's what you hunger for. So this is the man saying to him, you, you're not worthy. And when a man, oh, you know what I got on? I got on Versace. What am I saying? This is making me worthy. This is putting me on your level. Still trying to get into the master's shoes. And this is what we have to purge from our thought process. A lot of your homework assignments you get in college or high school, these are decides to gauge just where your aptitude is and should be considered a threat or not. I agree with that. Cause I got, I got, I went to college. I didn't even go there. I'm like, yo, I know I shouldn't have got bad on it. They want to make sure they want to see, are you thinking, are you a thinker or not? Can I mold your mind or not? If not, I give you bad grades. Though that's real talk though. That's real talk. I experienced that. <laughs> yeah. You want to get the big old ch chicken George coat. You know, you want to get the feather cause you pimping. I want to get the Prada. You want to get the uh, Tommy Hill figure, even though he said he don't like you. You want to get the Michael Kors, even though he said he don't want no weaves in his bag. But master, just let me put your clothes on. You know, in some, you used to get the cast off. We read other um, narratives where, you know, missus will give you her dress. You know, you got European, not only you got their pheromones, you got their smell. And sometimes we go so far, we want to put their hair on our head. Like how I look now, do I look just like you? These are the things we have to understand that the psychological damage goes deep. It says here, um... Why am I so turned up today? I don't know. But uh, let me see here. He says, on returning, no. Okay. We had carried our fishing lines with us and requested the privilege of fishing in this stream, which he roughly denied us, saying, we do not allow niggas to fish. Nothing daunting, however, by the rebuff, my brother went to another place where without asking permission of anyone, he succeeded in obtaining a plentiful supply of fish. And on returning, the young slaveholder seeming to be displeased at our success, always jealous, always watches, always envious. But knowing that we caught them in a stream which was not under his control, he said nothing. He knew that our master was a rich slaveholder and probably he guessed from our appearance that he was favorous to us. So perhaps he was about, he was somewhat induced from the consideration to let us alone. At any rate, he did not molest us anymore. We afterwards carried our corn to the mill belonging to Mr. Bullock, only about 10 miles distant from our plantation. This man was very kind to us. If we were late at, if it, if it were late at night, he would take us into his house, give us beds to sleep upon and take charge of our horses. He would even carry our grain himself into the mill. And he always furnished us in the morning with a good breakfast. We were rather astonished for some time that this man was so kind to us until we learned that he was not a slaveholder. This miller allowed us to catch as many fishes as we choose and ever furnished us with fishing implements when we had none or only very imperfect ones of our own. While at this mill, we became acquainted with a colored man from another part of the country. And as our desire was strong to learn how our brethren feared in other places, we questioned him respecting his treatment. He complained much of his hard fate. He said he had a wife and one child and begged for some of our fish to carry to his wife, which we gladly gave him. He told us that he had just sent a few hickory nuts to market for which he received 36 cents. And he had given the money to his wife to furnish her with some little articles of comfort. On our return from their place, one time 
we met with a colored man and woman who were very cross to each other. Remember what I told you about that, that, that relationship? We inquired as to the cause of their disagreement and the man told us that the woman had such a tongue, angry black woman, here we go, and that some of the, them and take a sheep, they did not get enough to eat. And this woman was after eating of it, went and told their master and they had all received a severe whipping. This man enjoined upon his slaves never to steal from him again, but to steal as much as they chose from any other person. Here goes the double standard. The master's like, don't steal from me, but steal from other people. And if they took care to do it in such a manner as the owner could not catch them in the act, nor be able to swear the property after they had fetched it, he would shield them from punishment provided they would give him a share of the meat. Are you hearing this? Sorry, I had to take a drink of water on that one. Um, because they would often say uh, that the slave master would teach you two commandments. No, three. No, two and one, you know, they got from el elsewhere. But one, they would say, uh, don't lie, don't steal, and um, honor your slave master. <laughs> and these were the, so the guy is telling them, you know, you can steal as long as you don't steal from me and you give me a piece of what you done stole. I find that wow. And I also would have to say for the man that he met along the way, you're still trying to make up some money to bring some comfort to his wife. You know, his 36 cents from the market. That That's also notable as well. You know, very notable that, you know, what his earnings, he tried to furnish his wife so that, you know, things wouldn't be as bad as they, that, as they were. So I find that interesting as well. It, it says, the man said he, they shouldn't steal. He said, not long after his, this, the slaves availing themselves of their master's protection, stole a pig from a neighboring plantation and according to their agreement, furnished their master with his share. Can you believe this? And you. The owner of the missing animal, however, having heard someone, something to make him suspect that what had become of his property came rushing into the house of the man who had just eaten of the stolen food and in a very excited manner demanded reparation for him for the beast which his slaves had stolen. And the villain rising from the table where he had just been eaten of the stolen property said, my servants know no more about your stolen hog than I do, which indeed was perfectly true. And the loser of the swine went away without saying any more. But although the master of this slave with whom we are talking had told him that it was no sin to steal from others, my brother took good care to let him know before we separated that it was much a sin in the sight of god to steal from the one as the other oh said the master niggas have nothing to do with god or god and indeed the whole feature of slavery is so utterly inconsistent with the principles of religion reason and humanity that is no wonder that the very mention of the word god grates upon the ears as if typifying the degradant no the degeneracy of the hellish system and then he ends with a poem, and then we'll pick up three, most I willing, either tomorrow or Thursday. He says, turn, great ruler of the skies, turn from their sins, their searching eyes, nor let the offenses of their hand within that book recorded stand. There is not a sparrow or a worm overlooked in thy decrees. Thou raises monarchs to a throne, they sink with equal ease. He says, May Christ's example all divine to us a model prove like his old G.O.D. our hearts incline our enemies to love. And he just ended his poem like he switched it on you real quick. But we're going to go to chapter three. It's not that many chapters in the book. Chapter, it goes up to chapter eight. And then he has a closing. So definitely most I willing. Since we got the preface and everything out the way, we'll be able to pick up on chapter three. I'm liking this narrative, you know, because again, he's building on our knowledge that we're acquiring. And by the way, congratulations. We have been, this is the fifth month, like the fifth, the five and a half months right now that we have been reading this narrative or not this one, but narratives of our four parents, five and a half months. That's not a short period of time. And hopefully you're learning as much as I am. Um, and that we will be more educated, more prepared to begin to look at our own selves, our own lives, our own families and community and gain some more understanding as we're having this conversation around slavery and the effects.
that we still experience today. So with that said, wow, right at the 11 o'clock hour. Uh, with that said, my name is Amuna Yisrael, Solanomics 101. This is the Left Project. Oh, yes. And by the way, myself and my young daughter, Shiloh, I'm going to keep saying it too. I'm going to share it. We just released a book. It's called My Brother, My Keeper. It's a ch young adult children's book. And so I'll put the link in here. Definitely go um, check it out. Uh, please support right here, mybookbag.org. We have a sneak peek of the first chapter. So you can go there and then you'll see a link that you can go and purchase the book and get the book and support. And uh, we'll be doing, what is it now? Writing, writing, it's getting late. We'll be doing writing courses, um, workshops for children. So this is what we kind of want to do this summer. This is what we're going to do. We already have one set for the 26. And to let children, like we see here, the importance of writing and sharing your story that those who come before you later on will learn from it and be able to grow from it. So I want to thank, uh, you know, those who came before us who took enough time to pen it and write it down. So uh, thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in. Brother King's son, Sister Tish, um, and everyone else that I don't see anyone else talking, but I know you're there listening. And I want to thank everybody who participated in this left project. And like I said, one more read on this and we should be done. And we'll probably go on to another narrative. So until that time, enjoy and uh, everybody have a blessed night. Shalom. <laughs>